So Idris, great, wonderful. I would like to get our people on the stage right away. I mean, come on, Brandon, come on, uh, Henry, where are you? I mean, I have the light so bright at me. So we have a wonderful panel that has only one big mistake, only men. <laughs> um, I, my apologies to the ladies. My apologies to you. This is not okay, fair. Okay. No. So that's why I'm making promotion for Elizabeth and her CD, okay? If you're interested in the music of uh, Elizabeth, she's making grand music, she's recording it, it's available there. And so, with that very honest apology, let's get down to... Henry, you flew in from where? Taiwan. Taiwan. Yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Rem you still remember it was yesterday. Uh, <laughs> delaying still. <laughs> uh, actually, in your time zone, it's already two Nine. days ago. But oh, okay. in our time yes. zone, it's still yesterday. <laughs> what is your business? So, uh, yeah, we do, uh, make stone paper. So we make paper from stone. Yes. Uh, so you're the guy who is uh, taking rocks. You crush it. You mix it with what? Uh, we'll crush it, make it into a powder. And then we will glue the powder together. Glue with what? Glue with uh, HDPE, which is a non-toxic resin, a glue. So that will be, uh, then we will mix it and then stretch it uh, lengthwise and widthwise and then create air bubbles inside. Um, l let me translate to you into another language. He takes two ingredients, he mixes them, turns into spaghetti. Once it's gone into spaghetti, he dries it out. And then he blows air on the bottom, and it uh, ends up as a sheet of paper, OK? Do we understand each other? And so that's what he's doing. And then because stones are more heavy, you added that to the end. Stones are more heavy than cellulose, right? What was your invention then? You added? So we added uh, air bubbles in between the stones. Well, why don't you just say air? Air, yes. Yeah, I mean, so you add air to it. Now, what's the cost price of air? <laughs> uh, do we agree air is rather cheap, <laughs> right? Uh, it's relatively in abundance, anything that's in abundance is rather cheap. And so, how many tons are you producing now? Uh, we now produce a little bit below uh, 500,000 tons per year. Yeah. And, and who is your client? Is that, uh, which country is your biggest customer? Oh, we have uh, distributors over more than 30 countries. No, so no, no, no. Who's the biggest one? Well, the biggest one, uh, it will range from... The <laughs> Apparently, he has signed an NDA. <laughs> Apparently, yes. there's a non-disclosure agreement here, and he's not allowed to disclose what is really happening. Where are all your factories? Okay, oh, uh, most of our, our factories in China right now, yes. Uh, well, you know, it depends on how you interpret it. According to China, <laughs> Taiwan is part of China, so yes. it's all in China, you know. It's, uh, I know he doesn't like to, to hear that, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so you are all in China. Why only Chinese manufacturing? Oh, because, um, firstly, we're very proximity, distance-wise, very close to China. And then uh, the investors that we've been working with are all mainly mining companies. So they have a need for the... And, and who people. owns the mining companies? Or the, the state provincial governments. And, yes, and, yes. and who is in charge of those state provincial governments? I just want to get the name out, you know. I mean, uh, <laughs> is it called the Communist Party of China? Oh, yes. yes yeah, yeah, yes, okay. Yes. So we understand, <laughs> <laughs> we, we understand each other, right? Uh, was this a trade secret I've just... Uh, no, 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 no. So it's the Communist Party of China is investing in the production of stone paper where you take waste rocks and you turn it into a paper. Why would China do that? What is the real interest of China to do it? Well, firstly, the, because the investors or the put, uh, production partners, they are mainly mining background companies. So they've got a lot of mining waste. So they ah. want to work with the mining waste. And normally that mining waste would end up in dust. And that dust contributes to some respiratory problems, OK? We understand. So they want to do, they want to have solutions for respiratory problems and for accumulating mining waste by producing paper. How expensive are you? Um, 
based on the same let, let, let's be the business talk right. capex and opex okay <laughs> okay capex opex <laughs> roi could we summarize right right so basically basically it's based on the same production capacity of a uh, pulp paper plant um, on a 200,000 tons per year plant it'll cost around 280 million usd it will give us about uh, 250 million in terms of revenue and uh, the ROI would be about 20% after tax. And how does that compare with uh, cellulose-based paper? Uh, in terms of cellulose-based paper, because uh, it's be uh, the pulp paper has been like 2,000 years history, so and then it's been really been moving for the last 50 years. So <laughs> basically, in the paper industry, the there's a slogan that's saying the paper profit is as thin as the paper <laughs> itself. So maybe, uh, if we look at it, maybe something around 5%, sometimes in China, you could get up to 10%, but most of the uh, profit margin is around only 5%. So we are about four times better on the profit margin wise. Now, from an environmental point of view, what's your energy side? How well, are you doing on the, energy compared right, to the traditional paper? On the energy side, we are about half of the energy based on the same uh, capacity, yes. So and that's because you don't move water around, you don't pump water, you don't have to dry, you don't have to... Right, right, because in a pulp paper production, you need to add a lot of strong acid-based bleach. So uh, there's a lot of water and um, uh, energy used in the production process. So basically, if you live in a near uh, pulp paper facility, you you wouldn't like too much of the smell there because that's the air pollution. So the biggest difference between stone paper and the pulp paper is would be the production process because we don't need to bleach or that means add. you have eliminated chemicals right we el eliminate a lot of chemicals and we've basically eliminated a lot of uh, water as well and then of course we don't use much trees and then on the way not we much trees no trees zero trees understand. yes okay <laughs> he wants to be politically correct <laughs> No need for being political correct in this meeting. You can just right. say it. And then we'll probably save about an equivalent of um, uh, for 200,000 tons per year plan. We'll say uh, we'll probably um, also save about 180,000 tons of CO2. Okay. So let me go down to basics. Which countries are your favorite countries to in, to competitively invest in? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, countries that have no water, right, right. that have no trees. Yes. So basically, uh, countries that would be really good for stone paper wise would be, um, of course, one is um, shortage of trees and um, have uh, very lim limited water and also have very good um, uh, pricing for the petrochemical because we use a glue in our paper. And the HDPE. HDPE, yeah. so that's a big part of the High density cost. polyethylene is the same what Tetra Pak uses on the inside of their bricks, okay? So it is a, it's a food grade, high quality polymer. It is a polymer, mm -hmm. but how many times can you reuse the polymer or the stone paper? How many times can you recycle it? We can recycle back in our facility uh, indefinitely. Yeah, so basically many times indefinitely. it comes back. Does this sound like an interesting proposal? Yes. You have a question, you can go ahead. We don't have to wait till the end, please. What's the infrastructure cost? Uh, the, the infrastructure, infrastructure. Oh, what infrastructure. do you have to build up? Okay, the investment cost for the plant and the machinery, we are about half of the pulp paper in terms of the same uh, capacity. So, half the capex. Now, you haven't responded yet on the OPEX. Oh, the OPEX. Uh, the OPEX, basically, we do, uh, we about half of that also, yeah. So half CAPEX, half OPEX, recyclable forever, no water, 50% less energy, 180,000 tons uh, of CO2 less. Mm -hmm. Why isn't the world jumping on this? Tell me. I mean, who's, who's responsible for this not being the standard on the market? Because it was your dad who, with his team, who started it. Right, right. So we started all the way back in 1990s, which is about 29 years ago. Yeah. And how many years did it take you to get the machinery in place? 
Oh, the machinery in place? The, the large volume machinery. Okay. Um, it took us about 17 years and um, 50 million US dollars just to get the mass production machinery. Why isn't the rest of the world going for this? I insist. Why? Well, basically, um, at the moment, we're still uh, working with different um, investors, so it does take a... No, 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 no. A... that's not the right answer, Henry. That's <laughs> not the right answer. I, I, again, you don't have to be politically correct. Right, right, right. Why is the world not really taking this up? What is your private opinion amongst all of those who have turned off their WhatsApp and so on, you know? What, what, what do you, what's happening there? Well, I think um, investors can still be quite conservative, in a way. Um, I but how can they be conservative? <laughs> half CapEx, half OPEX, recyclable forever, return the double of the standard. The, the mean, you mean they're all stupid? No, 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 no. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not all. The po Communist know? Party of China is not stupid. <laughs> I mean, the Communist Party got it. I mean, isn't this amazing? The Communist Party gets it, but those who have the cash and the money, they don't get it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it comes back to um, when you're an entrepreneur and when you're an MBA, so... <laughs> oh, there are too many MBAs! <laughs> are you ready to co-invest? Have co-investors? Yeah, we look at proposals so we can work and see how we can co-invest, yes. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the great news and I would like to have Asma come to the front. She is... Uh, hopefully around. Uh, I see her, of course. And uh, you have some documents with you. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> so the amazing thing is that OCP was here two years ago. We had meetings. We had discussions. So when were you in Morocco? Yeah, when? Uh, yeah. May. May this in May, year. he went to Morocco. He saw Morocco. He found a country that has uh, no water, hardly any water, that has uh, not so many trees. And uh, what, what are we about to sign? It's a letter of intent. And there is a beautiful table. So, ladies and gentlemen, you're witnessing the signature of the first letter of intent of an agreement to have the first factory outside, not funded by the Communist Party of China. Thank you. Uh, Christopher, can you please join? Because you are the witness of this. I mean, we're going to be practical here. I mean, please, uh, let's have the papers. Um, may, may I suggest you only sign the last page because this contract seems to be so thick that if we have to <laughs> sign everything. So, who, you, you must have a beautiful pen on you. Christopher, please. And is it printed on stone paper? <laughs> we haven't received the, next one, next one. <laughs> the machinery yet. <laughs> now, let's talk practical. Tomorrow, Samples, seven samples will go to his factory. He will certify. When he has agreed with them, containers will go to Taiwan. They will manufacture on the machinery of the factories in China. They will manufacture paper as a test. That paper will be converted to the bags, uh, the notebooks and everything you know. But the core market is going to be corrugated cardboard. The high growth of the corrugated cardboard that is happening is going to be substituted by mining waste. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment I'm very happy with. Yeah. Don't forget yeah. to sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. And where is the camera? Yeah. Oh, there is a the camera. We would like some still pictures. Asma, you should be right there on that side. Without the microphone? If all goes well, Asma, when will this factory be up and running? Uh, hopefully, the, yeah, it's working. the sooner the better for us. <laughs> the sooner the better. No. Ooh. Yeah, well, we need um, uh, 12 to 18 months after the official contract. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This is the Zermatt Summit in action. Thank you. <laughs>
and we're getting people off of opiates, we're getting people off of pills, you know, because it eliminates withdrawal symptoms and it's tremendous stuff. So you're going to see more and more of this. In the United States, it's almost in every single product now, from, uh, you know, uh, shampoo to toothpaste to, to oils and gummy bears and anything you can imagine. And so we're... But we're yes. <clears throat> he invited me to come and have a look at these production systems in America, particularly in Colorado, where they had the first uh, decision to liberate the market and to permit its growth. Mm -hmm. And I found this industry to be the most toxic industry that I've ever seen in farming. Because they're not regulated by the, by the federal government. That means they can do whatever they want. And what did we find about the chemistry? Well, a lot of it, I mean, for the, the plants itself, I mean, what we're finding a lot of, you know, you know for the, the, the waste side of it, I mean, that's what we're talking about right now, is we're, we're producing uh, currently, this one I brought Gunther in, around a million pounds a day of biomass waste from the cannabis One plants. million tons of biomass waste per pounds, day. Pounds, pounds, pounds. One million pounds per day That was waste. four years ago today, we're at two million pounds. We also are consuming to produce the, the more the, the THC side than what the, the video I'll show you in a minute will be the more the CBD where we're getting more into to utilizing the plant in more organic. I'll show organic farms. We're, we're one of the largest USDA certified organic farms of hemp in the United States currently. And that's our focus. And we're getting more into regenerative agriculture so too. This is important. The decision was made to turn this organic, to eliminate the chemistry. Because the plant doesn't need the chemistry. No. No, not very much. You don't, you don't need very much of it. You do need some, I guess, but very minimal compared to traditional crops. We're, you know, we're competing in the Midwest now with, with, with crops like corn and soybeans, well, and, and in the East Coast with tobacco farmers, and we're converting them all into Ooh, growing. What are you doing with tobacco farmers? So we, we, we have, have some people from the industry here. Yeah, well, if we can show the video, I'll show you some, some of the some of the. Let's uh, get the, the stuff. video going but, then. Um, yeah, so, but we, we are working with a lot of tobacco farmers who are losing their contracts right now. And, and providing them a little bit of hope and a little bit of cash flow, I think, to help survive some of these farms. Some of them are multi-generations, and, and, they're, and they're, a lot of them are going bankrupt and, and losing out right now. So what are we seeing here? So here we're seeing plants being delivered to happy farmers, uh, you know, because they're, they're seeing money right now. So that's, uh, they got the plants to here. Um, and so these are called clones, right? So these are feminized plants, and so 100% of these will be pretty much the same genetic and will produce a female plant, and that produces the highest amount of cannabinoids for us to produce the products that we're looking to get into the market. Currently, that right there would cost you about oh, $12,000 to $15,000 per acre investment. Uh, we can sell that for anywhere between sixty dollars and $100,000 today. So the numbers are very nice. Uh, could you, very could you please repeat that per hectare? A per hectare would be, so one acre would be, so two and a half two acres. And a half. So if we go per hectare, you're probably looking at around forty dollars to $50,000 investment. Uh, revenue to maybe one hundred and fifty to 250000 Per hectare? Per hectare. Per year? Per year. Excuse me, how many farmers do you know that can earn that kind of money? Now, I would like to repeat to you that that money before was going to the Mafia. Yes. That was money straight into the hands of the Mafia. It's now pumped into the local economy. What's the biggest economy now in Colorado? Well, I mean, the fastest growing is, is fastest cannabis growing and CBD. Economy? Yeah, CBD is the fastest growing market in the United States today. You know, so we, we're, we're expanding quite rapidly. When I started three, four years ago, we were you know, maybe a 30 or $40 million a year you know, business. Today, it's around $600 million, going up to around 6 to $8 billion within three or four years is what the predictions are showing. So once we get more legal and more open and we train more people and get the, the supply chain, get more professional, because the industry started not very professional and not very business oriented, and that's changing. And we've only been truly legal for seven months. Right, um, and so that's that's opening doors for investment. That's opening doors for change and innovation, and hopefully, uh, we can guide the circular economy with this plant going forward. I truly believe that the circular economy won't exist and won't get there without this plant going forward. It's one of the healthiest and strongest and most natural fibers on earth. We get building materials. I worked on car parts, and you know, I've done all those things. But the cash flow currently is in the nutraceuticals. So we're chasing the cash flow now, getting farmers excited to grow the plant again, and then hopefully we'll transition back into the protein and the fiber once we get the infrastructure in the United States. And what's happening in California? 
Oh, well, the energy, I mean, that's more energy. So we, we look at the whole plant of cannabis, not just, not just hemp and CBD. I believe all of it should be grown mostly outdoors and organically. But currently, total energy demand in California uh, of growing just cannabis is 3% of the total energy demand in California. That's 1% of the total U.S. energy demand. That is the most carbon-intense product on Earth. You know, and, and it's because they uh, are afraid of it and they force it to be grown indoors with expensive lighting. If they weren't afraid of this plant and they grow it naturally, we wouldn't have that problem. But currently the laws force that upon us. And so, so it is the most inefficient uh, crop uh, maybe even known to humanity at this are, point. Are you telling me that the amount of energy consumed is more than for the internet? For, you have to, to, I mean, I think if you want to go per square foot, yes. You know, I mean, right now. Um, but that will change, you know, I mean, I mean, eventually. And so that million pounds of waste, what is your proposal? Well, a lot of things. Uh, I mean, I've grown mushrooms off of it. That's from here. You know, we talk about surprise, that a lot. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> great substrate. Are these uh, mushrooms CBD mushrooms? Or well, are they... no, we grow like lion's mane, you know, turkey tail, ganoderma. But then we can blend that with the CBD and it makes it more beneficial all around as a product for us. You know, especially lion's mane and CBD mix very well together. Um, so, but yeah, so we, we uh, that, that, those, those things have we look at that, but the energy will be something we got to really focus on. But the, the million pounds we can convert into energy as well. So, so you know, if we were to um, use that biomass currently and pelletize it, it has more, uh, you know, BTUs than pine trees, right? So more, more energy can, you know, can be burned from that, or we could run it through an anaerobic digester and generate biogas off of it as well. So there's a lot of things we can do, but the infrastructure is not there. But now we have the time when we can get the investment and we can build that infrastructure, and then we can really change agriculture and, and, and maybe for around the world too, not just the United States. So how many countries have legalized now? Countries total, I don't, I don't know. I know we're at 46 states now, or 47 states in the US. So we, we, we're only three states shy from having the whole country. And that means the feds will have to come along? Yeah, they, they basically... The federal government. Yes, the federal government. So January, uh, I'm sorry, December 2018, Trump signed the, the Farm Bill, which fully uh, descheduled and legalized all hemp in the United States. So we're, we're no longer classified or scheduled as a, as a narcotic. We were, until then, uh, scheduled in the same uh, area as heroin or LSD, uh, even though it can't get you intoxicated. You know, there's other reasons for that, and I don't want to get into conspiracies today. <laughs> so if you take a perspective of the next 20 to 30 years, yes. what do you see happening? Well, I would see this um, as more and more farmers understand it, and more and more people get into more of the industrial applications. The markets will be, you know, worth trillions of dollars, not just billions of dollars. Uh, we can replace everything from, you know, uh, you know clothing to plastics. Uh, we have, uh, there's new people working on supercapacitors, you know, so energy storage, replacing graphene with hemp fiber. Uh, we work with plastics companies, you know, and so I think the excitement is that this plant can, anything petroleum can do, we can do with this plant. You know, and so, and we might be able to do it better and cheaper, um, but we just need the infrastructure and, and the support and, and the investment to, to scale. So investors are following? There's still more and more money's coming in every day. Who, uh, who has invested already in this, in this audience? One, two, <laughs> three, four. Actually, I see five hands. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah. next year it's going to be 50. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Applause for Brandon. The FDA. What? FDA. <laughs> so the FDA and the USDA currently are rewriting rules for standardization. We, we, you know, they could come in and regulate us as a drug. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, we're more of a, a vitamin. I look at us as a kind of like fish oil. You know, you can go to a, a doctor and he can prescribe fish oil to you, and pay a lot of money for it. Or you can go to the grocery store and get fish oil, and it's pretty much the same thing. You know, one might be a little cleaner than the other. Um, so we won't be able to make claims, you know, we, we won't be able to try to make drug claims. I'm not going to tell people, you know, this is going to help you with certain issues. That, that might be for the drugs. And so the FDA will stop us right now from making any kind of claim. Um, so that, and I'm okay with that. The public knows what it's good for and they use it for many different things, not just one thing. So I'm all right with that. And I, but I also believe that they need to step in to create these standards and regulations so we have more of a level playing field. Currently, we have thousands of companies starting in the United States and entrepreneurs, and, and everybody is doing a different processing, a different way of getting the product to market, and there's no standards or quality controls. And so you can buy a product, and it may say, you know, 50 milligrams of CBD, then you test it, and there's really only 30, or there might be 80. 
you know, it's not, but it's not consistent. You know, the customer doesn't know what they're getting yet. So we need to create those rules. We have to have the FDA and USDA to, to push that. Okay, great. I want to move on to the next entrepreneur. If you can hold that, please, huh? because we got another one. But Mats, why are you sitting over there? Yeah. You, you should be closer to us. I, I, I was just wondering, uh, Mats probably wanted to have the, big picture, the bigger picture, but uh, this is your seat, that's why I'm standing. Okay. And, <laughs> and Mats, he's from Sweden, yep. and he is again one of those entrepreneur scientists yep. who had an insight in one of the most toxic products that is spread everywhere in this hotel, and in any hotel, and just about any product or for which you need a fire insurance. Fire retardants. Fire retardants are in everything. And if we talk about plastics and microplastics, the real problem is not the plastic and the microplastic. It's a big problem. But the hardcore problem is the integration of fire retardants. And you're not at all the expert in fire retardants, but what did you develop? We have uh, developed an absolutely toxic-free, eco-friendly, and uh, in nature biodegradable chemical additives. Uh, to withstand fire attacks. And we have two different kinds of, of products. One which is called uh, BioEco, which is um, developed from, um, uh, should say, waste material from the plant kingdom. Uh, so, so his CBD yeah, material yeah, works, could be useful? It works well, very well to do. You see why one comes out with the other? Yeah, the, the main thing is here that all these materials that contain cellulose are different. You see cellulose like a headline, but each um, uh, type of cellulose are different. And what we are doing then, that is that we uh, modify the cellulose and we uh, change the ions of the cellulose to meet then different product applications. But and give me an example of different product applications. Of yeah, this, food uh, packages. For instance, if you um, look at food packages that you want today to have uh, some food which, which you put into the uh, freezer and then into the fridge and from that into the microwave oven for 900 watts in two, two minutes or in a convection oven for plus 200 degrees centigrade during 20 minutes, and um, <laughs> that, that is quite unique to have one type of food packages that can handle it. Um, yeah. And, but then you have this other one, you call it the molecular yeah, heat Yeah, then we eater. have the, uh, the type of MHE, which is molecular heat eater, that we developed uh, due to that flame retardant business um, have, uh, it corresponds to about 7 billion USD per annum and with a market growth of 6.9% per annum. And 50% of all these flame retardant host materials represents polyurethane resins, polyurethane foams, and soft PVC. That's a huge market. And we have then uh, products for that, that we have got accredited tested by, or certified by an accredited test <coughs> institute for fire safety standards according to the European uh, construction materials. And um, How did you invent it? How did you discover it? Yeah. It comes out of a fruit, I <laughs> yeah, understand. Yeah, 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 it was so that uh, one day it came up a man, we have worked, I worked since uh, 1983 with um, developing products, most for militaries. And uh, then after that, we were quite good then about different, what we could say, material, uh, chemical material compositions. Um, and due to that, he came up a man from Procter & Gamble, and uh, he asked then if it was possible for us to, uh, to develop a primary retardant that was absolutely toxic-free, eco-friendly in nature, biodegradable. At that time, I didn't know anything about flame retardant. That's uh, probably why you could develop it. <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, then I started to check all these uh, literature 
to find out uh, what it was. And then I noticed in chemistry that it corresponds to more, more or less every, the same. Toxic material uh, just changed some of the chemicals. And um, then I thought, how could we ever get something which was absolutely toxic free? So then... Uh, well, well, I mind. would ask the question, how <laughs> could we ever have approved the full toxic uh, load on us? Because it's in every curtain, it's in every carpet, it's in every <coughs> car, it's yeah. in every foam. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. We're breathing it, we're eating it. And when the microplastics get in the ocean, that fire retardant stays yeah, active. Absolutely. Right? And most of it depends on that they are inert. Inert means that they don't they are not uh, bound to the host material. <coughs> so when you, when you use a host material and you get small vibrations, mechanical vibrations, when you walk on this floor, you release some of these inert chemicals which goes up in the air and pollute the air and we are breathing it and getting inside our bodies and in the blood. And that is one thing why we... we thought for many years ago then that we would get a legislation that should change this because we have this material. It's the legislation never changed? Never, it has never changed. It's Greta Thunberg effect just now which has increased all the requests and requirements for these products. So what is your raw material for your Fire retardant. What yes, it's um, actually it's carboxylate. It's called. It's uh, carboxylic uh, carboxylic acids. Uh, that the salt of it, and um, you use. You find all these carboxylic acids in fruits, in uh, grapes. So in you bread. mean you you take grapes? What yeah. of the grape do you use to make it? <laughs> yeah, but you normally you use different of these uh, carboxylic acids yes. like citric acids. You use benzoic acid, which you use for conserva conservation of food and berries. And um, yeah, you have some things. And the, the, thing, the good thing is here, yeah, no consumer allows a bad smell. So it should really, doesn't smell anything. Because you can have it then on pillows and, and mattresses and things of that. So where is the factory? Where is the factory? Where are you manufacturing today? <laughs> yes, we, we don't. Because we are an R&D chemical laboratory company and we develop products. And then we have connections with, with the market for suppliers, marketing companies and retailers. And most thing now is concerning this bioeco <laughs> product line because it's based on waste material, and instead of doing biomass and putting it on fire, burning, we use it, and we can use the whole thing without adding any carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So, yeah, it's, it's quite brilliant. <laughs> 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 It is absolutely brilliant. So if I want to have my, my, my curtains yeah. made with a fire retardant that is derived from your know-how, yeah. can I find it? No, not at the moment on the market. But How we is this have, possible? We have, yeah, but you see, the thing was, we were sad. I, I have to tell you the story behind it. Because... Well, that's we, why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. It's so that... When we had all these things, and uh, we were in Sweden, and uh, everybody said, how come that the Sweden politicians didn't bother about it? Then Gordon Brown, he was a prime minister in England at that time, he uh, and his team from UKTI, they came to us and said, hello guys, can you move over to England, to Yorkshire County, because we have lost most of our... Uh, chemical industry to Southeast Asia. And if you come to us, we will give you five million British pounds to start up things. We mowed over. But you never we, got the five million pounds. Now the election came, you know that. <laughs> and he lost. And then David Cameron came and took over. 
And with the first thing that happens, they stop everything. And how uh, we, we couldn't sue the British government with uh, saying these papers. It should just have cost us all cost of lawyers and the fees for these things. So, so we are still in, in UK and we are connected then to Enterprise European Network <laughs> and we are now ongoing. We have uh, good connections with um, uh, food packaging industries. With, um, but you have the IP fully protected. We have the know-how. You see, it, it's very important. You know what I'm educated in. I'm, I'm quite well educated in patent technologies. And the problem is, when you go in for applying for a patent, you make most of this official. If you don't have money enough to defend your patent, you should never apply for a patent. That's very important. And what we have, we have the know-how in-house. And we keep now these know-how, and we are going to build a production for these things. And the Netherlands government are so interested of setting up and supporting this uh, because they have lots of waste material from the growers, tomato growers, tulips growers, lots of things, hemp growers, and we get out different kind of cellulose. I would like you to show some pictures. So you Are see the pictures the, there? The product, the, the product applications available, just to give you an, a hint about this. Yeah, you go, yeah. <laughs> Here you see toxic-free, eco-friendly, uh, blah, blah, blah. Recycling waste materials from the plant kingdom, carbon dioxide reduction, impregnation to withstand fire attacks, but also mold, fungus, and rot attacks. And you, you have to know that, that sawmills are producing planks, uh, wood, wooden planks, with 250 meters per minute. And they have to protect these planks to guarantee that they, for six months, are free of black mold. And the only product today available for that is a Swedish product called Grön Fri. And that is a so poison product that it's forbidden to be used for the next year. And so far there are no other products <coughs> so far available for this protection for black mold. But regarding the, the other things that can withstand uh, fire, it's something extra. That I, we have already talked about. Can we do the next slides? Mm. Uh, next yeah, slide. Yeah, no. ne next slide. Next two. Uh, yeah, next. here you see the market. We're trying. Yeah. To take next, the next slide. One. Next yeah. slide. Too much words. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we take that work. too. That that is what the market takes. So, so next you see. Slide. Yeah, take. I want to see the product. Here, here we are. Uh, here is uh, the BioEco special modified cellulose. It's transparent. You can use it for cotton. Uh, fabrics, and uh, it's very special in Australia, uh, North America, and England, that baby products up from zero to three years are treated uh, for uh, withstand fire attacks. And this is quite good for that, and it's transparent too. And we can even I take that later. Uh, the no. Next one. Yeah. yeah. Next one. Here, no, 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 no. Stop there. Ah. You have food package. I talked about that. Then you have paper wrap, impregnation, cotton fabrics, impregnation. I mean, uh, just a moment. Mm. The paper wraps you have has been treated with yeah. chemicals to avoid fiber. Fire. I mean, we got to yeah, wake yeah. up. We have put this chemical everywhere. I have to manage the time. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Mats, if you don't mind. Yeah. So if there's a special picture you want to show, let us know. Yes, go ahead. We take the pictures. Take the pictures, go yes. Detergent products. Here is cassava. We have treated, uh, sorry for the photo quality, but we got it from Biopackages uh, International in Thailand. They wanted to have this Biopackage treaty to withstand everything I've said before. We mixed it with cassava because they would like to use cassava for packaging. It works very well. It's certified for that. Next picture. Thank you. Here is cotton fabrics. We use it, treat it. We put this, as you see, with motor and lubricant. 
contaminated it, and then we wash it back again and get it clean. So you could even wash, your, you take the cotton fabrics on your garage floor with motor oil and lubricants, you, you wash it and, and then drop it into the cellulose again and it's clean. Okay, next, next one. Here it's uh, impregnation of wood with the stand, next picture. Here is for mold and fungus, next picture. Here is car wash and surface protection top uh, coating layer. You see, you can use another kind of modification of this cellulose. We have then for detergents, and it's not the same cellulose modification made for these different product applications. That is our secrecy, how we do it. And here, the professional car washer have used it. And United States' biggest, uh, could say, <laughs> supplier of uh, car wash and this material. They are so interested of this product for these things. And you can see that it withstand water drops and so, and if you have bitumen or asphalt, you say dots on it. Next, here is paper, very thin paper treated with the product. And next, here, here we have come into something interesting, but it's um, how it works on wound healing. Uh, we spray on, and it, in, it, it um, make everything shorter. But as Dr. Ekholm says here, uh, we have to make a further investigation. Yeah, now we come to something very interesting. Active firefighter for wild for forest fires and bushfires. Remember, it's absolutely toxic-free and eco-friendly nature biodegradable. It even get microorganisms to survive in... in um, in the neighborhood of the wildfires, you express it. That you have prophylactic firefighter to protect properties in the neighborhood of wildfires. Take the next one. Every year, no, 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 stop that. Every year, farms, barns, and stable are attacked by fire. Electric breakdown due to lightning or dust explosions. They are the most common. Animals are, are, are taken or caught by fire. Uh, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm sorry, Max. Yeah, yeah, okay. Then we have synthetic material. Both TDI and MDI. There are two different ways of doing it. Next one. Can you just Here. get a sense of the amount of P business opportunities we are looking at? I mean, that's what I want you to get the impression of. It's applicable to so many areas. It has such incredible raw material, which is simple. It's cellulose from all the different plants with different possible applications. Yeah. Matt, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we need some people in this audience who will be partnering with him so that when next year we're coming here, we're not signing, we're celebrating the business that has been developed. <laughs> because this is what we're in need of. This is such an incredible product. I've known you now for 12 years. A little bit more. A little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're getting yeah. older. Yeah, we yeah. become older. So, I mean, it is one of these <laughs> products where I see development after development, and I'm wondering, how come this so-called free market of capitalists... I'm, I'm going to have to go and take it to China. I'm going to have to present it to the Communist Party. <laughs> because they're going to be interested. For me, this is the platform for multiple entrepreneurial initiatives. It's not for the big corporations to have one. But let's move over to coffee. Who has tried? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> when you got here yesterday, there was this little sachet. And did you ever open it and ever try to eat it? So what in the hell, Rivis, have you been doing with coffee? You turned it solid, right? Well, it's difficult to name it because uh, we tried to call it solid coffee. Then people don't get the idea. We, we, we can't call it coffee chocolate because it's not really chocolate. Uh, it doesn't contain cocoa powder. So, uh, and also, uh, to market, uh, there are very different price uh, factors for, for coffee chocolate and for a product. And chocolate is a candy, and this bar is a proper uh, substitute of coffee. So one bar contains something of a uh, caffeine, like like one espresso. But what's in there? Explain so this. Yeah. So so we we look on coffee fruit as the whole thing that we uh, want to work with, 
And currently we use ho- uh, coffee bean and coffee cherry or fruit of coffee. So it's the whole cherry, the outside which is normally peeled off and the bean that you normally roast. And what yeah. do you do next? So we, uh, we have an innovative uh, processing uh, for those materials. Uh, not uh, as it's used for, for uh, putting coffee in the water because uh, we then combine uh, cocoa butter, the same uh, type of fat that you meet in chocolate, with those coffee bean and fruit of coffee, and we process similarly like uh, chocolate. So the 10 grams, you all got a little bar of 10 grams. What would you compare it with? It's equal to what? It's, it's equal to one espresso, latte, cappuccino, Americano, whatever. It, and what it about is. these other energy things like Red Bull and Monster? Well, uh, it depends on the side. Uh, side. Actually, we, uh, so, so, so in, in our mind, uh, sustainable coffee is not just uh, sustainable for the nature or sustainable for the farmer, but the also sustainable use of caffeine, so healthy habit. So it's actually a little bit less than uh, large cans of uh, caffeine you get in the energy drink, but because it's fat-based, it's uh, absorbed much slower, so it's actually more efficient. You don't get caffeine spikes and drops. So actually, when you drive by the wheel, uh, or you need to focus for long ter- term, uh, uh, this bar works better because it's about four hours effective instead of two hours when you... So my advice is if you find two of them, don't eat them tonight. Yeah, definitely. Don't eat uh, it in, in Idris, the you had the experience, I understand. Would you mind, uh, last year you liked it so much, you started eating them and you couldn't sleep for... Yeah, on the record, I want to tell you this story right to assassinate him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who can't hear, he's saying that I tried to assassinate him last year. I did. He's pitching the product so well that uh, like a year ago, he was pitching the product... product. Sorry, and uh, it, it, the pitching was so good. It was like, yeah, you've got those bars in the bags, and they, they taste great. So I was like, they do taste great. So I had one, and then I asked my neighbor, hey, could you spare yours as well? And <laughs> and I had three freaking bars. And after ten minutes, he goes like, hey, by the way, don't take more than two two bits because they are like one coffee cup each. <laughs> so I ended up having. But the worst you survived, night. all right. Uh, yeah, right. The guinea pig effect was okay. They're really good. Yeah, you should have them definitely. <laughs> Yeah, well, you, you, you don't get more caffeine than from cup of coffee. It's just effective longer. Actually, you can u- with, with this product, you can use less coffee to get the same amount of energy. Now, where are you based? We're in Latvia, Lettonia, or Latland. Have you event. ever associated Latvia with uh, coffee and with uh, energy bars? What do you associate Latvia with? <laughs> Nothing, probably. <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. That's the privilege of the audience. What do you associate Latvia with? People don't know the country. What would you like it to be associated with? Uh, Sustainable uh, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, sustainable use of uh, wood, uh, and yeah, coffee. And coffee is a barista. Now, let us tell you the business model we're preparing. Okay, because we don't have just a product to present, it's a business model. And the core for the transformation of the economy with the entrepreneurs is that you have a business model that supports not just the businessman, the entrepreneur, but the ecosystem. If you have, and we're preparing that in Colombia, Madagascar, and Indonesia, if you have organic coffee and organic cacao, you mix it as Ravis just described it. How much can you pay the farmer? Well, at least double uh, to what they receive now. You can pay double. You can pay double to the point that actually the farmer will have an interest to have more because the supply of organic coffee, as you heard yesterday from Giuseppe Lavazza, is limited. The supply of organic cacao is very limited. And therefore, we can pay the farmers to buy the land back to plant, regenerate the forest, and inside the forest have the cacao and the coffee to make these products. So this is a solid coffee that is healthy, 
that regenerate forests and that allows you to tolerate very low productivity. And zero waste. And zero waste. And the productivity can only be 750 kilograms per hectare, whereas the industry goes for five tons per hectare. And you can still make the farmer thrive. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the consumption models we have to change. Now, what is the richest thing you have in the cascara? So uh, that's antioxidant from group flavonoid, uh, epicatechine particularly, that are very beneficial for uh, brain cell protection. Which is the largest source of uh, this kind of great food for you? Uh, sorry? The greatest source in the nature. So that, that is coffee cherry. The coffee cherry which today we throw away is the greatest source of Flavonoids, antioxidants. Yeah, antioxidants. Can you imagine? I mean, where is our artificial intelligence uh, study? That's a, a, I mean, you were yeah. making very complex uh, proposals, but you know, the simplicity of the human being is lacking all intelligence. It's roughly 30 times more potent than blueberry. That's what this berry, that's what this little bar is all about. Congratulations. I learned about this a few years ago, and uh, we have decided to invest $200,000 in this company to move it forward. And we've organized the distribution. We're organizing now the distribution for it in Japan, where you already have a great start in Fukuoka. And our planning is to really take this global. We have to have great business that's very healthy, that turns nature back on its evolutionary path. And now we have, if you give me <coughs> two more minutes to the organizer, we have a gentleman who was not on the agenda, but you're very welcome. <laughs> who hasn't met Charlie yet? Hey. Everyone knows him. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to avoid him. He is a great writer. He is an extraordinary professor with his students. And he decided to leave, and that's what I wanted to have as a story for you to conclude today. He decided to leave academia because you're a professor at the University of Adelaide, you decided to leave and do what? After one conversation with, with Gunther, uh, we met, we're members of the Club of Rome, and we were sitting at the lunch, and Jürgen Rangers and Gunther were sitting down, and they were talking about things. I'd spent 15 years trying to figure out how to be more sustainable, how to make engineering work, and all we were getting was efficiency and use less and productivity, and maybe you can sell your waste and that makes it okay. But when Gunther was talking about the Blue Economy project, it's more than just making it efficient. And for us, it was about, um, the young lady said this morning, doing cool things with cool people, but actually bringing the value back into where it's generated. We've heard a lot about helping farmers, helping communities, so much the international business model now. And in Australia, we're very much an, an agri-focused uh, country. So much of the pressure is put onto farmers. I mean, the farmers take the risk, they have to deal with the nature, they deal with so much risk, and they get so much of the, like, it's so, such a small percentage of the value that they create. So the opportunity to not only be able to get new technologies and fun technologies and cool technologies, but to deliver it in the way that Gunter said, the business model actually to bring more value. Into Which the are market. the first proposals you're taking to the market in Australia? So the first thing we want to do is we want to take, we want to actually make a legitimate bioplastic. Those of you that know bioplastic, uh, PLA, a lot of the bioplastic is made using corn. So we're literally turning food into plastic. And we don't, we don't think that's very sustainable. And in that way, the one product that already had a small margin, now the economics of it change. So the technology that we're working with an incredible innovator who hopefully will be here next year, um, Gordon Yu from Taiwan, an, an amazing innovator, has created a process with his team, again, over 15 years, working tirelessly and investing everything he has. So you can sell the corn and take what's left over to create a genuinely compostable, in nature compostable, plastic alternative. So you can drop it into the water. That's, that's one initiative, the second That's the one. FPC. OK, so the next, the next initiative is to take the toxicity out of dealing with e-waste. In Australia, we, put, we literally put 97% of the waste that goes in our bins into shipping containers, and we send them to Asian countries to deal with the issue. And a lot of the time they deal with the issue is they have these piles of keyboards and computers and all this sort of stuff, and they take cyanide without the proper handling process. And I don't know if any of you have had anything to do with cyanide. This stuff is evil. Like you, but it works. But it works. So you have these people pouring the cyanide to try and get these small amounts of metal out of these products, incredibly toxic. 
So another one of Gordon's teams has created a process, a, a, a non-toxic process to, re to, to retrieve these precious metals. So non-toxic that when my team and I and with Gunter, we went to the factory, you could put your fingers into the fluid as it's removing the gold from the product. Great. Is there a third project? Absolutely. <laughs> you see, we do not want one <laughs> entrepreneur focusing on one thing. We want portfolios of development. That is the mindset we have. Every one of them has portfolios of initiatives. We cannot do just what the core business logic is imposing on us. The next one. Absolutely. So the next, Gordon's big plan. And this plan, is the last one. The last one, the last one is to, li to be able to take ocean plastic and do an advanced pyrolysis process, which beats any emission standards for diesel. It's so clean, it has no emissions. You can barely see there's no smoke. Uh, 10 parts per million sulfur. And the, the grand dream is to have a barge that travels in the ocean, picks up all the ocean plastic, because ocean plastic is heavily degraded, UV degraded, mm -hmm. creates an ultra low emissions diesel, and fills up the passing ships as they go by. Those of you that are um, <coughs> familiar with ships, they use something called bunker fuel. It is the most polluting, like 15, 20,000 parts per million sulfur. It's absolutely disgusting fuel. Nobody else wants, but it's in the ocean, so it's okay, right? You can use it as in the ocean, it's fine, right? But no. So, so we can take that plastic and have you talked to clean Marco? diesel. Have you talked to Marco about this? Oh, Marco, <coughs> it's time. It's time. Great, <laughs> it's time. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we had an hour and 10 minutes together. An amazing set of people. Portfolios of investment opportunities. Portfolios of chances to change the rules of the game. If we're not changing the rules of the game at the micro level, how we manage the business, and change the rules of the game at the macro level, we're not going to have the transformation we all aspire. And that is why I appreciate so much learning to know all of you, working with you, and making things happen with you. Thank you.